storm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. gathering of the Lord Jesus Christ, one people brought under one Lord. Um, well, with the week we've had, we really need to meet together as God's people. Am I okay, Michael? Yep. Um, well, with the week we've had, um, with the referendum, the outbreak of conflict and carnage in the Middle East, um, and depending on where we sit on those issues, there is much that can potentially divide us as people. Um, But let's remember that in the cross of Jesus, we've seen the worst of injustice and oppression thrown onto the one man. And out of that, out of that cross came the resurrection where Jesus Christ poured out every spiritual blessing from his Father. And so there is much more to unite us than there is to divide us. So hear these words from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. Hear these words, church. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, 
just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come tonight to yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. We cast our cares upon you. We lift up our voices to you in praise. And in the midst of all our insecurities and fears, we declare that Jesus Christ is victorious over all. So please refresh us, change us, and enable us to cling to him in any and every situation so that much praise might go to his name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, may I start by uh, saying welcome to you again. Welcome to those who are joining us online, uh, particularly a call out to the contingent of regular members who are watching from Taiwan. Uh, who knew? Five of us are in Taiwan, but I just thought I'd say hello uh, as well. Uh, to our beloved teenagers and youth, I know that you would normally go out and join your youth leaders, but Sam's a little unwell tonight, so he's asked that you just stay put for tonight, you stay with the bigger, wider church family, and your little group will continue uh, next week as well. I'm going to invite you to turn to your neighbour, uh, say hello to them, ask how the weekend's gone for them, and to kind of just connect with the people around you. Would you please do that now? Uh, brothers and sisters, if I could ask you to put a pause on those conversations. Uh, well done. By my look, no one was left out of a conversation. That's exactly the way it should be. Um, continue those chats. We're going to go to the Statesman tonight for some dinner a little bit later. It's a couple of hundred metres up the road and um, all are welcome to come along. Well, friends, I think what we've been dealing with in our society and in our world is very much a world that has been very much prone to violence, um, to things where uh, people just do the most maddening things. And I've been looking through my little Anglican prayer book, and there's a whole bunch of prayers of confession, and particularly there's a part of it that really centres on this whole difficult experience of the way in which we violate one another. And as we enter into a time where we confess our sins, um, it's easy to think that the problem is out there uh, when actually the problem is right in here. And there are some normal words of confession that we go through, and we can kind of do that by rote and grow a little stale with it. So I'm going to read some different words out just to kind of really um, get us owning 
the reality of this in our own life. So this is just something a little bit different from the prayer book, and then we'll join together in the words of a common confession. It says this, O God, you have searched us out and known us, and all that we are is open to you. We confess that we have sinned. We have used our power to dominate and our weakness to manipulate. We have evaded responsibility and failed to confront evil. We have denied dignity to ourselves and to each other and fallen into despair. Now, at this point, uh, I'm not going to get us all to do it, but it actually calls for the fact that all members of the congregation would turn to one another, say that prayer, and then say this to God, which I'll just read now. So we turn to you, O God. We renounce evil. We claim your love. And we ask that you make us whole. So if that's your desire, friends, I'm going to ask you to say aloud these words together. Together, as one people. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, over these next seven weeks, our Father in heaven is going to unfold for us a vivid vision of the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ that he secured for us. And it's a victory over sin, suffering, persecution, and chaos. And it's the book of Revelation that's been given to us to bless us and inspire faithfulness to Jesus in a world where desires are rampant, deceit is everywhere, and suffering and oppression rules the day. Uh, We need to hear this book of Revelation. So I'm going to invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to start from verses 1 to 20. This is probably the perfect book to grab a hard copy Bible, given that we're going to be going through large portions of it. James, you lead the congregation well, brother. Um, So turn to Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 20, and then we'll have our regular lectionary reading from Matthew's Gospel. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, 
who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I saw, turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Church, hear the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. For whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom." Church, hear the word of the Lord. So, good afternoon. It's great to see you all here this afternoon. Uh, what is indeed a fairly uh, somewhat harrowing and emotional week it has been uh, at a number of levels, of course. When we rightfully ask... <clears throat> If God is in charge and Jesus is ruling in heaven, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Why so much injustice and division? If the kingdom of God has arrived in Jesus, why do things continue as they do and have done for the last 2,000 years? 
Well, today we are starting this new sermon series on the last book of the Bible called Revelation, and it's timely because, and I planned this uh, some months ago, uh, but indeed Revelation helps us to answer these kinds of questions that I guess are part of our experience uh, of recent uh, events. Uh, now, we may not always be satisfied with the answers that we might discover in the book of Revelation. Indeed, we may get a bit lost. In fact, you will get lost in some of the imagery and symbols and uh, uh, accounts of uh, frightening beasts and dragons and battles and symbolic numbers that we're going to come across. Um, but if nothing else, as we journey through, it will remind us that God is fully aware of all the terrible things that go on in the world and that are indeed reflected in, uh, as, uh, in this book of Revelation. And he speaks into it. And he is working out his plans, which end very, very well. So the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, indeed the last two uh, chapters of the whole Bible... Uh, we get a sense of the ending, which of course is the coming of the new heaven and earth. Uh, and I'm going to read a, uh, a couple of uh, verses for you. Don't worry about look, looking them up. Just, just listen to this uh, as we get a sense of the ending, of where it's all headed. The angel showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, it shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Well, it's going to take us seven weeks to get to that point. But that is where we're headed. Uh, and indeed, in uh, seven weeks, 22 chapters, uh, that's uh, an average of three chapters a week, uh, or a bit more indeed. So we're going to be dealing with some quite big chunks at a time. But today, by way of introduction, we're going to just dip into chapter one, uh, which we've read uh, and we're going to answer three basic questions of this whole book, just to get us set, ready for Revelation. Number one, what kind of literature is this? Secondly, what are the keys for its interpretation? And third, what can I expect to learn from it? So, let's have a think about what kind of literature is Revelation. Because if you read it, and I'm sure... Pretty much all of you have read it or read part of it or heard about it. Uh, it's plainly different to every other book in the New Testament. It just stands out. This is a bit weird. We get a sense of, though, what it is from the very first verse, the first part of the first verse. It says, the revelation from Jesus Christ. And the Greek word for revelation, and it was originally written as Greek, is apocalypsis. From which, of course, we get the word apocalypse. And you might have all kind of ideas of, what does that mean? Well, you kind of know what it means. It has a range of meanings, actually. Uh, but uh, the one that uh, I, I want to um, draw to your attention is that an apocalypse was actually a fairly common form of writing around the first century and a bit before and a bit after, indeed, uh, which... Uh, uses symbols to describe the end times, the time when God will come to do away with his enemies and to vindicate his holy people. It's a kind of, um, it's almost like a victorious kind of writing, uh, but using a lot of symbols and uh, imagery uh, around it. There were quite a lot of apocalypses written around this same time as Revelation. So, even though it looks weird to us and it stands out in the rest of the New Testament, actually for those first century readers, they go, okay, that's an apocalypse. It was not an uncommon type of writing. But what makes this apocalypse different is that it has the authority of God behind it. 
well and truly. It is written by the Apostle John, uh, as we've heard. And that's why, of course, it is included in the New Testament along with the rest of uh, uh, the um, authoritative scriptures uh, from the apostles. And so, second half of verse 1, this revelation was given from Jesus Christ, uh, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, however strange it might feel, however kind of, kind of worried you are about it, just remember, actually, this is a word from God. This is God's word, uh, and we must read it and learn from it. But before we do talk a little more about what we can expect to learn from it, I want to go into that second introductory question. Uh, what are some of the keys to help us unlock its secrets? And for that, I'm going to be guided by uh, Bishop Paul Barnett. I was saying this morning, he's one of my favorite bishops. I don't know whether you can have a favorite bishop. I've got one. His name's Paul Barnett. Uh, he's still alive. Uh, he's el uh, reasonably older, elderly, uh, in Sydney now. But he was a uh, bishop. He's also one of my lecturers at uh, Moore College. Uh, and he's written, a great li he's written quite a few uh, Christian books. He's an author, uh, theologian. Uh, and he's written a good little commentary on the book of Revelation. He suggests four keys for its interpretation, which I think are helpful, and we're going to be uh, using these to help us along. Firstly, crack the code. Crack the symbolic code. Once you've got a, a bit of an idea of what these numbers, and we've already come across a bunch of numbers in this first chapter, what these uh, lampstands and scrolls and creatures and colors might mean, then it's going to help us get into this book and understand it more. Crack the code. Now, it's going to be hard to pin down all of these symbols and uh, just open up the whole code, but some of them uh, we can just quite easily uh, come to understand because they were common of the time and they were common in apocalypses, other kinds of apocalypses. So, for example, the number seven... Uh, is the number for fullness or completeness. And we've seen a bit of that in you already in chapter 1. Uh, a thousand is just a very big number. The dragon, who we'll come across later, uh, is Satan. Uh, white is the color of conquest. Um, a horn is a symbol of power. And all of these things that we might already know because uh, we've got other writings that use similar kind of symbols. But sometimes we know what a symbol means because it says in Revelation, it's explained to us. Did you notice that at the, at the end of uh, chapter 1, verse 20? The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That's helpful. But sometimes that's what we're going to see. So we will be uh, teasing out some of these symbols more as we work through the book. Second key for its interpretation, learn the layout. Two L's. Learn the layout. Now, I love reading maps. I don't know whether, you know, some people like maps, some people don't need maps. No, some of them are saying maps just useless. Why, why do you have a map? In fact, maybe you younger generation, you don't use maps anymore, do you? Just put it on your phone and say, take me there. And uh, it's a sort of a map, isn't it? But uh, I feel more comfortable with a big book or, you know, one of the old paper maps and so on. Because I, I like working out where things are in relation to other things. Uh, I love Google Earth. I'll often spend time spinning the globe, zooming in and thinking, wow, I wonder what's there. You know, this is a weird part of the world. And you, you come in, you can see little houses. And, but, and, and indeed, when I'm out driving uh, to a place that I don't know and I don't have a map, I get really nervous uh, and, I, and I, I quickly lose a sense of direction. Luckily, my wife has a very good sense of direction, so she'll sometimes guide me. But, um, but here's the thing. 
When you delve into or journey into the book of Revelation, it's really helpful to take a map with you, learning the layout and thinking about that. Uh, and indeed, we will be uh, drawing your attention to this layout uh, as we journey through it. But I want to give you uh, just a bit of a heads up uh, so that you can at least be confident that this is not just a a weird, chaotic book of all kinds of crazy things going in all kinds of crazy directions. So, chapters 1 to 3 is um, the first of a number of visions which uh, God gives to John, which is, um, in this vision, in this first part, uh, a message for seven churches about how they're going and to encourage them in the face of ever-increasing pressures and persecutions that's coming. So that's chapters 1 to 3, and we'll do the remaining of that uh, next week. Then there is a second vision, which is set up in chapters 4 to 5, where John is taken into the throne room of heaven. One of my all-time favorite chapters in the Bible, but Ben's preaching on that one, so I missed out on that. Uh, but that'll come in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and then in chapters 6 to 16, as part of that vision, when John is in the throne room of heaven, he has shown the difficult journey that God's people must go through before the arrival of the new heaven and earth. And it's described, don't worry if you can't remember all of this, I'm just giving you a heads up to say it's okay, there is a map, we will get there. Uh, it's described in four concurrent episodes which is going to be important, not, not sequential, but concurrent, uh, which Paul Barnett characterizes as tyranny, chaos, persecution, and destruction. And we're going to come to those uh, in due course. And then finally, in chapters 17 to 22, there is the final judgment and the arrival of the new heaven and earth. So, there is an ordered layout. There is a, a map uh, that we can refer to, if you like, uh, and that's going to be important as we work through it. Third key for interpretation, two Ps, perceive the parallelism. That is the connection between the stuff that we're reading in uh, Revelation and the historical situation of John's day, because... Not, not everyone agrees with this, but I think it is quite, uh, I think this is true, uh, that uh, John is also speaking not only about what's to come and general experiences of Christians on the way to the new heaven and earth, but specifically some of the things that are actually around in his time. Uh, so, um, uh, so, for example, uh, we, we're going to see kind of beasts and horns and battles going on and some of it will be clearly seen to be paralleling the Roman Empire the Roman Emperor the beastly pagans uh, causing trouble across the world at that time so as I say we will draw some of this out along the way fourth and final key for interpretation most important we must focus on Jesus Christ. So the truth is, Revelation is not a book simply for predicting the future or indeed interpreting the times as uh, some just think it is. It's actually primarily about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, that in his death and resurrection, he won a victory over God's enemies that now he is enthroned in heaven with all power and dominion and soon he will return as victor and when he does he will bring judgment and the new heaven and earth. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't it? That's what we're going to see uh, throughout Revelation. Indeed, we get a good sense of this gospel uh, in this first chapter, in this first vision of John, which indeed is a vision of Jesus. And I'll pick it up halfway through verse 12. Uh, 
And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. And in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. It's a vision of Jesus standing alongside his churches saying, it's okay. I am enthroned in heaven. I am with you. I have dominion. And if you have forgotten that in your Christian life or lost sight of it, as indeed maybe at times like we've just seen in the last week and we look at some terrible events around the world, we need to be reminded of it as we begin Revelation, this is where the book starts. Just remember who is Jesus, where he is, where he's standing now. But, and indeed Christ's victory leads us on to the third and final introductory question for Revelation. What can I expect to learn from this book And we've already, of course, uh, seen some of that. Um, And as I said, it's not what some people think and what Revelation, I think, is wrongly famous for. Uh, It actually doesn't give us a detailed blueprint of what will happen in the future. Now, some people go to great lengths and uh, write a lot and draw a lot (laughs) and sort of show you how all these things in Revelation point to specific events in history, and this is what's going to happen, and that's what's going to happen. Um, It doesn't actually predict which evil empire or dictator will arise and when. I don't think it does. It doesn't actually tell you exactly that Jesus is arriving not far from now, Look at what's going on in Israel. Look at Revelation. This is how it all works out. People have been coming up with those ideas for the last 2,000 years. I guess it was a big one in 1947. And so we do need to be a little careful when we try and force Revelation to say something that really I don't think it is trying to say. Rather, Revelation answers this most important question which I began with, if Jesus has conquered all and is ruler of the world, why is there so much evil and hatred in the world? Why is there suffering and injustice and division? Where is God in all this? When will Jesus finally return and put things right? When will we see the new heaven and earth and is it worth waiting for? How good will it be? And how am I supposed to live in the meantime? Do you have those kinds of questions? You probably do at different times. I trust that Revelation is going to help us to give answers and hope and encouragement and renewed strength as we journey on uh, through our lives in this sometimes broken, divided world. And indeed... What a great encouragement it is, isn't it? Chapter 1, verse 3. Have a look at that. I'll finish here. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Thank you for reading the whole chapter this afternoon, Ronaldo. And about, uh, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. That's our prayer. That's what we can trust in. God, in his word, says you will be blessed as you read this 
and take it to heart. So it's going to be great. I'm going to invite our musicians to come forward as we continue on. Um, can everyone please stand and we'll sing together. Oh, glory. 
seated. Aren't we so blessed with our musicians? It's been a wonderful day, actually, across all the services. Do you know, I was even inspired to raise my hands at the 10 o'clock service in one of our songs. It doesn't happen very often, but I might even do it tonight. Who knows? Thank you so much. So we've got uh, questions um, over there. James? James down there. I got a new grandchild called James. James? So I've got a new appreciation of the name. Excellent. I, I actually heard he shares both my first names, so there's um, some copying going on. Um, he's another James Edward. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Keep going, um, James. Question. <laughs> question from me is about verse 1. Yeah. Um, it says um, what must soon take place, mm. and then verse 3, because the time is near. Mm. Um, I guess a lot of the questions non-Christians in particular ask of Christians is you're waiting for this Jesus guy to come back. Mm. It's been a couple of thousand years. There's a lot of soon language. Mm. Um, I just yeah, would inter- be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, it's soon. good. Thank you, James. So um, uh, I think it's what we get a sense of uh, and the way of thinking about this is uh, in regard to Jesus' return, it's soon and it's near because it's already Like everything is prepared there's nothing more to be done. We're just waiting for the full number of uh, God's people to, to come into the kingdom, if you like, which, is, which God knows. Um, uh, there's no more work to be done. It's imminent, but it's been imminent for 2,000 years, um, and we need to be ready for it. Um, so uh, I think it, it gives us that sense. And, and if not um, the return of Jesus, then... Um, other things that Revelation is going to be talking about that are happening and going to happen, um, you know, we can kind of get a sense that expect this to be happening even now or tomorrow or the next day. I'm not talking about the... Sorry, that might be Jesus, but it, it might also be the chaos, tyranny, persecution, suffering that uh, uh, Revelation also speaks into. You know, don't be surprised if these things are here now or, or just around the corner. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Guy, for your sermon um, and for, I think, some really helpful pointers as we take on Revelation, which I'm Mm. nervously excited for. So Um, am I. (laughs) I have a question on verse 10. Um, John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Um, Mm. And I guess my question is, what does it mean to be in the spirit? Um, Is that something that we do today and perhaps use different language for or um, is it something we should be doing? I don't know, do you have any thoughts on what that kind of means? Uh, I didn't think too much about it, Eleanor, Uh, but I would take it, uh, uh, this is a, um, being in the spirit in the context of Revelation is uh, uh, th- this, is, this is a vehicle, if you like, for the visions that he has given. Um, it's difficult to know and explain exactly what that might have been for John, um, what, what his physical experience was at the time, but I think it is uh, an, an understanding that uh, uh, in the spirit, it is, it's, this was, he was caught up in this vision that God, by his spirit, is, is bringing for John. So um, I don't know whether anyone else has got any particular thoughts around that. I- I'm sure some sort of traditions uh, have uh, made you know, much of this and, uh, and talked about that, but um, yeah, I'm not really sure. All right. Ryan, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to lead us in prayer, but before we pray, I just wanted to say, particularly in a week like this, I would be honoured to pray with or for anyone about any topic. I mean, I'll be up the front over this side after the end of the service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin our sermon series on the book of Revelation here, we are once again seized by a hope and longing for that day when you will be revealed in your full glory and goodness. For we have been haunted 
over the past weeks by revelations of a different kind. Events that reveal the depravity, cruelty and hatred that us fallen humans are capable of. We have seen the horror in and around Israel, the unfolding tragedy in Armenia and Azerbaijan, the ongoing devastation in Ukraine, plus so many other situations we don't really notice. Sadly, as these events reverberate around the world, they only bring about the best in a few of us, but the worst of us in more of us. We can only cry. We humans do not deserve your love or attention. And yet, Lord, please help us all. Almighty God, at this time, we are once again grateful at how blessed we are here to live in such a beautiful city in a peaceful country. We want to thank you this weekend that, in contrast to how similar issues across the world in history often play out and lead to violence and even war, we have managed here in Australia an orderly democratic referendum process. We know that this peace is something precious and we ask for your spirit of grace and humility to be with us all across leaders and communities across our nation. May we all be more like you, denying ourselves, picking up our crosses and focused on those in need, especially right now our Indigenous sisters and brothers. Beloved Creator, we want to thank you immensely for everything you are doing in our community here at the Good Shepherd. Thank you for our leaders. We ask for your blessings on the many things we are doing, both formally as part of the church and informally in the community. We particularly ask for wisdom and excess with all our youth and children's work, including for our efforts to support and reach out beyond the church community with Christian education in schools. Please open doors to this ministry, call children in to listen to your great news and bring all the volunteers we need. And finally, today, in our ever broken world, we need your spirit to shine ever more. May we uh, here today, this coming week, reflect some of your light in our lives to those around us as we are bold to live out your truth compassionate to share your message, and so doing, live as true ambassadors of Christ. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, talk uh, a little more about uh, the Good Shepherd Deacon Congregation plant. Uh, I'm talking about it this week because next week's fourth Sunday of the month and in the lead up to its formal uh, weekly launch uh, on the fourth Sunday of the month, uh, the congregation will be meeting together uh, over at Barton actually while we wait for the new early learning center to be built in Deacon. Uh, so St. Mark's Theological Center have kindly opened up the uh, facilities there uh, for this uh, Good Shepherd congregation to be meeting um, now, uh, it's an exciting time, uh, and uh, we as a church, I think, need to be following God's lead as he uh, brings people here to uh, the Good Shepherd at Curtin. Uh, so we are finding more and more that uh, this building getting filled up. In fact, at 10 o'clock this morning, it, it was you know, standing room only pretty much at the back at the beginning when we have all our kids and children. Um, we want to honour what God is doing and so looking for new space to have a new congregation. Now here's the thing, uh, it's important to understand this is not a, a, a new independent church that we're starting off uh, that will go off on its uh, own way. Uh, this will be a sixth congregation of the Good Shepherd. We've got five already meeting here on Sunday and Tuesday 
uh, and then um, like next Sunday, but certainly f- weekly from the 4th of February next year, there's going to be another congregation that'll actually be meeting in Barton. It's going to be uh, led by um, Ben and his wife Rowan, uh, lead pastor, uh, we think we're going to call them at the moment. I'll still be the rector. Uh, it'll still be wholly within the Good Shepherd governance and financial uh, work as um, Uh, sort of system umbrella if you like Uh, indeed um, I'm going to I I don't think I have to ask Ben I'll just tell him that I'm going to be preaching there uh, regularly but not every week by any stretch but I'm going to come and and, uh, I want to be very much a part of it uh, and and I'm sure Ronaldo will will be there at times as well Um, so uh, that's going to be really exciting Um, the good thing about here at 4.30 and the 8.30 people uh, where there are some folk from 8.30 who've already committed to going, is that you could actually go to both for a time. You could go to Barton at 11 a.m., uh, enjoy that opportunity to uh, be in a different kind of uh, different um, environment. Uh, church will feel a little different, but connecting perhaps with different community. Uh, but you can also be here uh, on Sunday afternoon as well uh, and enjoy this time. That, that's, um, that's a possibility, isn't it, Ben? Try before you buy is one way of thinking about it. Um, So, uh, but I also wanted just to highlight for us, uh, and we'll see it more as as it gets closer, that uh, in these sorts of ventures, it does does affect the home church, the sending church, if you like. Uh, We're going to be prepared for that. Uh, I, I want some of you to go. I'm not sure I want all of you to go, because you won't fit in in the new place, okay? But I want some of you to go, uh, and that means we'll look out and -and so-and-so's not gonna be here and -and so-and-so, although, you know, for a while you might wanna do both, that's fine. Um, But, uh, so there is a sense of loss that we might uh, experience. It's gonna be a loss in the sense of uh, perhaps some people who have particular ministries at the moment, they won't be able to do them here or they won't be doing them here, they'll be serving uh, over there. So we're prepared for that. We know that sort of thing is gonna happen. Uh, and we want to have an opportunity, though, uh, to further uh, this great work that we're doing uh, under God and by the guide of his spirit uh, through a new congregation meeting over there initially at Barton. And here's one interesting fact. Statistically, new congregations, new church plants grow faster than established uh, churches, uh, if established churches grow at all. Uh, but praise God, this church has been growing. Um, but uh, So there's exciting times ahead. Um, if you want uh, a reminder of uh, all that's going on, don't forget we have these little leaflets, uh, but also on our existing church website you'll find a link to, uh, is it called Deacon Plant, I think? Deacon Church? Deacon? Something to do with Deacon. Yeah, but it's on, it's on the website, isn't it? If you t- okay, right, anyway. Talk to Ben if you'd like some more information about it. Thank you. Uh, friends, the Lord does keep bringing people to us. If you're new to us today, um, we want to say welcome to you. Um, we are a church at such a size now that you could do us some help by letting us know that you're here. We've got these things called Connect Cards. They're at the back over there. If one of our friendly welcomers brings one to you, uh, don't be offended. That's just us trying to say we want you to take the next steps here as well. Uh, on the back of that card, which is a physical card, you can write your details, put into that black Perspex box there, and we'll be able to help you take the next steps here at Good Shepherd. Um, not thinking about the church plant here, but we, the year is rapidly drawing to a close for us, and we know that given how highly mobile society is these days, people come, some people also go, sad face. Um, but um, we'd want to be able to just kind of appropriately farewell you. If that's going to be you at some point at the end of the year or coming into the new year, could you send an email to Ronaldo? R-O-N-A-L-D-O, at gschurch.org.au. It'd be good to know if you are moving on, and that way we could just farewell you at some point here um, before the year closes and we get into the mad rush of Christmas as well. Uh, On a smaller note, I'm taking next Sunday um, on leave because I'm moving house. Fourth move in two and a half years, right? So uh, I'm hoping this will be the last one until the new creation comes and then I can move in there. 
So um, if you do need to reach me, please email me or call me. I'm really available for you, particularly if it's something urgent, but you won't see my face here next Sunday. So let's stand and we're going to sing our final song. So this next one is a slightly, ever so slightly, adapted hymn um, that we all know and love. And um, so sing with gusto and please reflect on this, meditate on this as you go throughout your week um, with all the things going on in this world right now, just to let God be your vision. Let's sing.
friends, as we remain standing, just a reminder that um, all are welcome to join us for dinner. And uh, Revelation is about centering on Christ. So let me read these verses. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.